Good morning, everyone. My name is Aptin Shahlai. I'm one of the Retina um, Fellows. Uh, welcome to Retina Imaging Conference. I'll be presenting today's cases. Our first case goes to Dr. Light. This is a 56-year-old gentleman with painless decrease in left-sided vision for about three weeks. All right, to get started, uh, this is a, the right eye. It is a wide field pseudo color image. Vision is 20-25 in this eye. Overall, uh, media looks clear, disc looks sharp, vasculature looks normal, macula is without lesions, and the periphery looks clear. I would say this is a fairly normal appearing fundus. Agreed. And zoomed in as well. Again, shows no hemorrhages, no lesions here in the uh, macula. This is the affected eye. So in the affected left eye, 2200 vision, uh, the media, again, are clear on this side. Disc looks sharp, maybe about a 0 0.5, 0 0.6 cup to disc. Vascu uh, vasculature itself looks normal course and caliber. Uh, the periphery is without lesions. However, it does appear that there are some changes here in the central macula. Looks like maybe some subretinal hemorrhage. It'd be nice to kind of get it a little bit more zoomed in to see, but then there's also this clear delineation here. Could be subretinal fluid versus PED. Okay, I'll give you a zoomed in image as well. Yeah, so I think uh, this clearly shows that likely some subretinal fluid here right in the central macula. Again, you can see this kind of crescentic shaped uh, hemorrhage here, a little hard to say, but maybe sub subretinal as well. And then there's this kind of whitish change and hard to tell if it's in the retina or maybe under the retina. Um, but uh, I think that that kind of summarizes the, the main finding and likely why his vision is decreased. Clinically, it looked like hemorrhage as well. And uh, wide field fundus autofluorescence of the right eye, aside from some maybe nonspecific hyper and hypofluorescent changes out here in the nasal and inferior periphery, uh, the overall autofluorescence pattern appears normal. And in the left eye, um, again, some nasal pigmentary change here with some mixed hyper and hypo autofluorescence. And then the attention here, again, to that lesion in the macula. You can see in this well delineated area corresponding to what I thought was probably subretinal fluid, there is a little bit of hyper autofluorescent signal. And then in the center here, there's hypo signal corresponding to that hemorrhage, and then a couple of additional foci of hyper autofluorescence. Excellent. And those peripheral changes on the clinical exam look like pigmented lattice. Can you go, go back to go, uh, right in the center, there's a little hypo spot. And then when you go back and look at the color, the pseudo color, you'll see that that uh, corresponds to a little area of RPE hyperpigmentation right there. Yeah. Not that it's worth anything, but. Does that mean anything? Absolutely nothing. That's why I said it doesn't mean anything. That is like uh, 20 microns. <laughs> 20 microns matters. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, wide field uh, IVFA imaging of the right eye at 1 minute 13 seconds. Looks like we are already in the full AV phase at this point. No perfusion defects. The disc uh, is of normal fluorescence, and there's no leakage. Uh, in the macula at this phase here. And late frame at four minutes and 51 seconds. Um, we do actually see a little bit of some punctate foci of hyperfluorescence here. Unclear if that's maybe some mild window defect from some pigmentary change. Uh, it doesn't really look like leakage. There's maybe a couple of microaneurysms out here in the far periphery and mild attenuation of the perfusion. But otherwise, this looks to be a normal uh, FA. Agreed, and jumping to the affected eye, this was where we got the transit, obviously. Yeah, so 18 seconds early frame here in the left eye. Uh, we are in the primarily the arterial phase still. Um, it looks like the perfusion, again, it's still early, um, is OK. Uh, already here in the center of the macula, though, corresponding to those pigmented and, and hemorrhagic area that we saw in the color, we can see some early hyper signal suggesting that there's either early staining or maybe some window defect uh, in this area. And moving along to 28 seconds, uh, now clearly full AV phase. Uh, 
Again, the perfusion is similar to the right eye. It looks pretty full, but again, in the center of the macula, some persistent uh, uh, either early staining versus window defect here. And now at 1 minute 15 seconds, again, still AV phase here, uh, we're now seeing some microaneurysms out here in the far periphery, kind of similar to what was seen in the, in the right eye as well. Again, maybe some mild hypoperfusion out in the far temporal periphery. And this central lesion now is uh, quite uh, hyperfluorescent. Uh, be interested to see if that leaks, uh, but it is starting to look more like a staining PED. Uh, and then in the late frame here, again, I think you could make an argument that there is some loss of the borders here, that it is probably some mild leakage uh, coming from that central lesion. Uh, OCT horizontal raster through the right eye uh, involving the fovea, infrared on FOS looks overall normal. Uh, the B scan itself shows partial posterior vitreous detachment, though the hyaloid face is still visible. Inner and outer retinal lamination patterns are normal, and the choroid appears to be of normal thickness, essentially a normal scan. And in the left eye, um, again, uh, we can now see this lesion, which has mixed hyper and hyporeflectant characteristics on uh, infrared imaging. Again, you can see the well-delineated area of uh, likely subretinal fluid here. And in the B scan, again, the hyaloid is still visible here in this section of the frame. The lamination patterns overall look preserved. However, there is some interesting kind of or hyper uh, reflective signal here from the uh, inner plex or the outer plexiform layer here. And then there's clearly a collection of subretinal fluid um, here at the, uh, in this uh, scan line, which looks to be just uh, superior to the fovea. And maybe you could make an argument for some shaggy photoreceptor change uh, overlying it. Um, the RPE, though, overall looks intact in this frame, and the choroid is of normal thickness. Excellent, and then we'll get a lower cut. Yeah, so moving down into the actual foveal area now, the pertinent findings here. I mean, we do see this looks like probable thickening of the outer nuclear layer, possibly some edema that has not co coalesced into cystic spaces. Again, still some of this hyper-reflective signal is seen in the uh, junction of the inner and outer retina. Uh, persist, uh, additional areas of subretinal fluid more centrally, but we also see these collections subretinally of iso to hyper-reflective material. One could maybe make an argument that Brooks membrane or the RPE complex is disrupted here and that this area of hyper-reflective material might actually be communicating between the choroid and the subretinal space. So what doc Dr. Polito was seeing earlier, we see now. <laughs> and then inferiorly, uh, it looks like just additional uh, subretinal fluid here. Okay, so given the constellation of the findings, we were thinking this, this is a choroidal neovascular membrane. Uh, Dr. Light, what sort of diagnoses do you think about when you think about this? Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, talked about the differentials for CNV in the past. You know, AMD is probably first, second, and third on the differential, though in this case, we really don't see the typical drusenoid changes in this eye or in the fellow eye that we would expect to see. Uh, PCV is another thing that you always consider, as well as myopic uh, choroidal neovascularization. Um, I'd also want to know about uh, you know, any sort of history of trauma. Did he have choroidal rupture in the past, which can predispose? Or any history of uveitis in particular, maybe a posterior uveitis, like a multifocal or a PIC, that can cause uh, secondary uh, choroidal uh, neovascularization. Um, and then, I don't know, any prior laser treatments or anything, other sort of traumatic insults. Um, those would be, I think, probably the, the big ones I would consider. Yeah, that's, that's a great list, and I think you covered everything that I was uh, having on my list as well. I also put I dealt with teleform as well, even though this patient didn't have any evidence of fe fellow eye involvement, and then uh, angioid streaks and choroidal tumors as well. So in our patient, he didn't have- Can I make a comment about choroidal tumors since you put it up? It's teasing me. Um, pretty rare to see choroidal neovascularization with choroidal tumors. Yes, with choroidal osteoma, rare with choroidal nevus, almost never with choroidal melanoma or metastasis or hemangioma or lymphoma. So we could refine that to choroidal osteoma and rarely choroidal nevus. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then are we saying this is, are we saying this is type 1, type 2, or type 3? 
I would probably call it type two. I think so. Go back to the OCT. Can we see if it's under the RPE? Um, and um, you can kind of see the RPE. Uh, and it's hard to be, it, it's type two, it's type oh, one going to type two, I think. It's breaking through. Where, where do you see it breaking through? I just, uh, I feel like I see the RPE kind of pretty contiguous. Well, right, uh -huh. uh, go, to, go to the left of that. Um, I, I, I think. <laughs> I hope this is on camera. <laughs> Got it. Is, is that another thing? Is that the Polito spot we were seeing? The 20 micron Polito spot that corresponds <laughs> to that thing there? I, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you kind of see that in uh, adult onset foveal macular vitelliform dystrophy. It tends to be in the middle, but that's one of the classic signs of it. Dr. Shields, quick question. Do you ever see cordial neovascularization after plaque therapy for cordial melanomas or not commonly? Very, very rarely. So we'll see more retinal neovascularization if we create an ischemic retina, or we'll see PCV. And um, Rick Spade was the first to report on that, PCV following plaque of choroidal melanoma. You get big dilated ectatic choroidal vessels in the bed of where the melanoma was. We don't necessarily treat it unless they're causing exudation. How does the choroid look here? I'm just curious. We didn't. Is it thick or not really? I won't. Yeah, we didn't think it's... it was particularly thick. I don't have an EDI. Mm -hmm. So in our patient, um, he did not have a significant refractive error. He didn't have any family history. Uh, he was a non-smoker, and he did report a history of blunt trauma to the left eye, um, getting fisted into the eye a few years back. So in this case, we thought this was uh, a CNVM secondary to ocular trauma. And this is the largest series that I found out in the literature. It consisted of more than 800 patients with a diagnosis of ocular blunt trauma, and only 37 of these cases had positive macular findings, 33 of which had evidence of a choroidal rupture. And in six out of those 37 patients with macular findings, there was actually a CNVM noted. Um, interestingly, there was no retinal findings that showed to have a positive association or correlation with CNVM formation. And the presenting visual acuity and the formation of CNVM showed correlations positive and negative, um, respectively, with the final visual acuity of the patient. And this is a series that I found on anti-VEGF therapy in people with choroidal neovascularization, secondary to a choroidal rupture. Um, 54 patients with a unilateral choroidal rupture after ocular trauma was, were evaluated retrospectively, and then 11 of these patients had a diagnosis of a CNV, and five of them at the time of diagnosis were deemed to be active and were treated. The interval between the trauma and the diagnosis was around half a year, and they received a mean of about four injections, ranging from one to eight, and there was regression of CNV noted in all of those eyes. So pretty small case series, but the largest that I found in the literature. So in our patient, um, we started anti-VEGF therapy with Avastin. Four weeks after the initial diagnosis, we see substantial improvement in the subretinal fluid, the acuity, and that PED we were seeing a little more clearly right now. And after nine weeks uh, and the second Avastin injection, we have complete resolution of the subretinal fluid, fluid and improvement in vision to 2040. Um, I wanted to ask the attendings on their treatment approach for these. Um, do they treat it, do you treat it similar to a myopic CNVM, meaning keep injecting until they get dry and then do PRN? Do people do treat and extend for this patient? Is there a particular approach that you prefer? 
I think these secondary membranes tend to respond really well to anti-VEGF, whether it's myopic, uveitic, or you know, traumatic. And so I think uh, you know, either extending very quickly or PRNing after the initial loading dose is okay. So I know you mentioned PED-like lesion, but wouldn't that be very odd for traumatic uh, CNVM? It's usually a type two. It goes right through Brooks membrane into the subretinal space. So maybe that's just the walling off. Like we see in younger patients, CNVM tends to get walled off and the RPE kind of migrates around it and makes it look slightly pigmented. We see this in young kids, slightly pigmented CNVMs. So I still think this is a type two and I think it's kind of getting walled off by the migration of the RPE around it. I, I and I agree because if there's a traumatic rupture, it's a little baby rupture, right? Uh, because we can't even see the rupture. Could you say that again? Little baby rupture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, um, it could be. I can't tell you it's not, but there's no real evidence of a rupture there that I could, you know, see it. it it's really small, if it were. Back to the, the two journals. So I'm just sort of surprised. These are um, online journals. They're, they're certainly not high impact factor. This would seem to be, from a retinal point of view, a, a relatively important issue. Sort of makes you wonder why these weren't accepted. I, I don't imagine they submitted this as their first choice. Uh, and I'm just curious as to what limited these from being accepted in a for lack of a better word, a more major journal. Well, I think here, this is only 37 cases. There are bigger series out there that have been previously published on a topic in much more prestigious journals like 10, 15 years ago. So if you actually look at the bottom one and you take the R squared, which is really what's the important thing, it's a R squared of 30.36, and the R squared of the coronal neovascular memory information is then um, around 0.1. Very small there. So we did obtain OCT angiography uh, on the patient's follow-ups as well. And as we can see, uh, both on the B scan itself and the OMPOS image, we can appreciate uh, the CNVM as well as the flow going through this area that we were discussing, type one versus type two lesion. And on the subsequent follow-ups, we see regression of this lesion here as well. Um, I also wanted to ask about obtaining OCTA and then in the context of a CNVM, are there specific diagnoses or instances in clinic where you would utilize this over an FA, for instance? I really like it for CSR because sometimes the FA, it's just hard to distinguish with all the hyperfluorescence. Um, that's the biggest biggest utilization that I've had for it. I think, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, CNVM in the setting of CSR, also myopic CNVM can sometimes be challenging to diagnose. And so uh, on the fluorescein, it may not be leaking too much, uh, but OCATA uh, gives you the, the nice detail. And just a quick review of the sensitivity and the specificity of OCTA. This is one of the first studies that was published in the context of uh, CNVM secondary to AMD and comparing it in a series, prospective series of patients who had a diagnosis of treatment knife CNV due to AMD, non-neovascular AMD and normal controls. And they compared this to the gold standard of FA and OCT and found the sensitivity of 81% when just looking at the ONFOS OCTA alone. And four out, out of the six false negatives in this context were due to subretinal hemorrhages being present and probably blocking the signal. And this sensitivity did improve to 94% when these subretinal hemorrhage cases were excluded. Interestingly, if you add the cross-sectional OCTA and look at the flow signals on the B scan, the sensitivity does increase to 100%. So importance of looking at both when analyzing the images. And interestingly, this looking at structural OCT alone did also have a sensitivity of 100%. And going into the specificity, when looking at ONFOS OCTA images, um, more than 90% for both graders. And looking at structural OCT alone, 97% and 85%. And combining cross-sectional OCTA 
uh, with unfossil CTA increased the specificity to 97% and 100%. It also helps having like Yalija and David Huang, you know, uh, being some of the readers here. <laughs> So going to the second case, Dr. Sivalingam, we have a 67-year-old female who reports having central vision loss in the shape of maybe a scotoma that she's reporting for the past week. It started with a couple days of floaters, and then she started developing this rapid scotoma. So here you have a wide field color fundus photo of the right eye. Vision is 2020. Media. Um, hard to say if this is from categories a little bit fuzzy, kind of overall. It's a little um, out of focus. Okay, gotcha. Um, disc margin looks sharp. Vessels look normal in their coursing caliber. Um, macula overall looks flat. I don't see any lesions, no hemorrhages. And visualized periphery looks relatively normal. Maybe some scattered pigmentary changes out here. Um, overall, normal to me. Agreed. And here we have the left eye. Vision is significantly decreased. at count fingers at six feet. Media, clear. Um, disc margin looks relatively sharp. Hard to say for sure. Maybe some blurring of the margin here. Um, normal cup to disc. Vessels look rather tortuous in their coursing caliber, um, superiorly and inferiorly. Um, Looking at the macula, we see these kind of scattered, very subtle blot hemorrhages superiorly, and then down over here a little bit more nasally. Um, and then visualized periphery, we see these, I don't know if these are, are peripheral drusen um, or pigmentary changes. Um, I don't see any hemorrhages or any retinal whitening out in the periphery. Yeah. Hemorrhage right here, too. Agreed. Yeah, that's hemorrhage. And then also this one is a small hemorrhage as well. Gotcha. Yeah. And fundus autofluorescence of the right eye overall looks normal. <clears throat> and then here we have the left eye. We, here we do see the blockage from those hemorrhages that we were seeing here. Um, and those hemorrhages over here that Dr. Polito pointed out, and then over here nasally as well. You can really see the difference in the vessels too, yeah. if you compare the right versus the left out of fluorescence. Yeah. Um, IVFA of the left eye, here we are at 33 seconds. Looks like we are venous laminar phase here. Um, Nicely demonstrating that tortuosity of the veins. Um, macula looks okay. I don't see any leakage. Um, disc looks okay as well. And periphery looks okay as well. Hard to say. These little punctate areas of hyperfluorescence um, early phase, they don't really look like microaneurysms per se. Uh, we can see how they behave in the later frames. Um, and here we are at 44 seconds. Um, macula still looks relatively normal. Um, maybe some subtle hyperfluorescence surrounding the disc, but it certainly doesn't look like any brisk leakage. And it looks like a later frame, full AV phase. Macula again looks normal. Here out in the temporal periphery, maybe some subtle microvascular leakage. Um, but overall looks pretty good. Here we are in the right eye at one minute and one minute and four seconds. Um, full AV phase. Macula looks normal. Uh, disc looks normal. The periphery here, again, we see similar of those punctate, hyperfluorescent lesions. I don't know if these are drusen. Um, they don't look like they're leaking, and we were already at a minute here. The distributions seem to correspond with those drusenoid changes we were seeing. Yeah. And a later frame at four minutes and 10 seconds. Um, so overall, pretty normal. 
Um, I don't see any frank leakage. Um, and here we have um, horizontal OCT through the right eye. Um, the infrared image looks normal. Um, the B scan itself, vitreous is clear. We can see the hyloid still attached, nicely inserting here on the optic nerve. Um, inner and outer retinal laminations look well preserved. Choroid looks normal um, in thickness. Okay, and here we have a horizontal cut through the left eye. Looking at this infrared image here, we see these kind of multifocal, hyper-reflective areas that I don't think we saw in the color fundus photo here. Um, looking at the B scan itself, vitreous is clear, hyloid again is still attached, um, nerve fiber layer looks normal, outer nuclear, outer plexiform looks okay, and then, sorry, inner nuclear, inner plexiform looks okay, and then here we see some kind of hyper-reflectivity in the outer plexiform and outer nuclear layers extending out into the ellipsoid zone as well. Um, and it looks like, if you look at where it's scanning through, it looks like it's correlating to these hyper-reflective lesions on the infrared image. Um, and so this disruption here in the ellipsoid zone probably accounts for, for significant visual loss of count fingers vision. Um, and here we have an EDI um, through the left eye, um, kind of showing us her choroid. It looks relatively normal to me, but again, we see redemonstration of this kind of hyperreflectivity um, in the outer nuclear and ellipsoid zone here, correlating again to those hyperreflective lesions. Great description. So some OCTA images as well yeah. across so different we, layers. Yeah. So here we have an OCTA of the left eye. Looks like we are through the superficial plexus here. Um, relatively normal flow signal correlating to the vessels that we see. The reflectivity also looks normal yeah. as well on yeah. the left panel. Yeah. And here we are, um, mid-retina, um, looking at these images here, possibly some subtle hyper-reflectivity surrounding the veins here, superiorly and inferiorly as well. Um, flow signal looks normal. Yeah, definitely very subtle findings there. The flow itself looks... Uh, unremarkable. Okay, and here we're in the um, avascular slab here. If you look at the same areas that we saw that were kind of hyper-reflective, here they look hypo, um, perivenularly, superiorly, and inferiorly as well. Um, so I don't know if that's shadowing from the prior hyper-reflectivity that we were seeing in the previous slab. Um, and then flow signal looks normal. Okay, so Dr. Sivalingam, can you describe our positive findings here and then um, do they all come together in form of like a diagnosis, a unifying diagnosis? Yeah, so we have a 67-year-old female um, with unilateral blot hemorrhages, vascular tortuosity, um, significant outer retinal disruption on her OCT. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind looking at those vascular changes is some type of vein occlusion. Um, you know, I don't see any diabetic changes in the other eye, but certainly that's something to think about. I'd like to know more about her medical history if she have risk factors like hypertension, um, hyperlipidemia, um, but this, this looks like something vascular to me, um, especially with her significantly affected vision um, and those kind of focal um, OCT findings. Yeah, agreed. So um, vascular tortuosity, the scattered hemorrhages, those outer retinal changes we were seeing, um, our thought was also this is some form of vein occlusion or vascular event. Hyperviscosity, less likely there, there wasn't any changes in the fellow eye. 
and the outer retinal changes did seem to appear like um, an AMN or maybe a resolving AMN to us when we saw the patient. Um, I wanted to ask if the attendings, what the attendings think about impending RVO as an entity. Now in our patient, there was some retinal hemorrhage and the patient did have vision loss. Would anyone at this point call this an impending RVO or do they believe in such an entity? Uh, I think here the damage has happened already. I mean, impending RVOs, I think it's a thing, but uh, clearly there was something else going on before that left the outer retina uh, disrupted. So a little more about the patient's history. Um, she had moderate myopia. She did report that she fell and hit her forehead nine days prior to the incident, which was about two to three days prior to becoming symptomatic in that eye. Her past medical history was significant from some metabolic risk factors. She was pre-diabetic, she was on metformin, and she had non-alcoholic -alco steatohepatosis. And uh, she was on a few medications as well uh, for that. And she did receive her COVID booster one day prior to um, being referred to the emergency room where I saw her first. And the family history was positive for cardiac disease in the father at a young age. The mom had a history of lymphoma. Um, she didn't report any excessive caffeine intake, uh, alcohol, or illicit drug use, but, and was a former smoker, and she was Caucasian. So Dr. Sivalingam, seeing her for the first time, would this be someone you'll do any particular workup for systemically? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. She certainly, you know, is in the age group. She has vascular risk factors. Um, whether or not I would send a hypercoag panel, I think you could go either way. Um, usually in these situations, I send a letter to the primary care doctor with our findings. Um, if she were younger, healthy, without any risk factors, potentially. I mean, the COVID, the recent COVID vaccine is an interesting one. Um, you know, and I wonder if there's anything in the literature finding any um, abnormalities in their coag panel at that time. Yeah, I agree. So she definitely does have some risk factors for a vein occlusion, but those outer retinal changes were looked a little atypical to me when I saw her first in the emergency room. And looking at the literature, and we discussed this briefly in a previous conference, but both retinal vein occlusion and AMN have previously been reported. Um, one by our very own Dr. Yonakawa and Dr. Patel. So in, that con in this context, I did do a little bit of a workup for this patient while she was in the emergency room. The blood pressure was normal, the pulse rate, rate was regular, the platelet count was normal, the lipid panel was normal, the A1C level was increased from her prior testing that was done, and this was on metformin. So she was in the diabetic range at this point. Uh, fibrinogen testing and ESR came back normal. The D-dimer testing was borderline elevated, and this time I did perform a platelet antibody screening panel, including platelet factor four, Dr. Polito, which came back normal. When would you follow this patient up? Yeah, I mean, given her significant visual loss, I'd probably see her relatively soon. I think it's reasonable within like a few weeks um, just to see how this progresses um, and if there's any resolution, if she develops macular edema. Um, so I would say, you know, within a few weeks. Okay. Would the attendings agree a couple weeks? Reasonable? So she came back two weeks later. It was This is where her scheduled appointment with us. So the right eye was unremarkable and this was the left eye. Wow. Yeah. So significant worsening of those rather subtle findings. So vision is a little bit worse at count fingers at three feet, and we see these diffuse blot hemorrhages throughout the posterior pole and periphery. Vessels, to me, look a little bit more tortuous. These maybe look like some cotton wool spots here. Um, so this looks like progression of what looks like a vein occlusion to me. Yeah, looks normal, infrared, yeah. Yeah, and then we nicely see, you know, redemonstration of these blot hemorrhages with blockage um, and the autofluorescent signal. 
Okay, so we have a horizontal cut OCT through the left eye. Um, and here we see, I believe these hypo-reflective areas correlate to those hemorrhages that we were seeing on the color fundus photo. Um, interestingly, here at the B scan, you know, we still, so those areas where there was focal hyperreflectivity, a disruption of the ellipsoid, ellipsoid zone, we see loss of that reflectivity, but there is continued disruption of those outer retinal layers. But then here, more closer to the inner retina, so inner plexiform, inner nuclear, there's this kind of focal hyperreflective lesion here as well as over here and here adjacent as well. So this kind of patchy multifocal areas of hyperreflectivity kind of looks like a PAM lesion to me just given its location. Agreed, and it has this skip configuration as well. Yeah, yeah and similar findings. Here we have some cystic changes um, out here and then continued disruption of the ellipsoid zone and more cystic changes here as well. And this is just a comparison between uh, the two visits that the patient had with us. So uh, adding to the prior findings, more retinal hemorrhages here. There's some evidence of paracentral acute middle maculopathy right now. And we thought this was a diagnosis of central retinal vein occlusion with some features of both PAM and AMN. So PAM and AMM are distinctive entities that anatomically and clinically can be di differentiated using multimodal imaging. With PAM lesions, we tend to see hyperreflective bands at the level of the inner nuclear layer, and they're indicative of hypoperfusion to the deep vascular plexus, um, usually mo more commonly the intermediate capillary plexus of the retina in this trilaminar configuration. In AMN, we see the hyperreflectivity at the level of the outer plexiform layer and outer nuclear layer, and there is associated disruption of the ellipsoid zone similar to what our patient was demonstrating as well. And the thought is this is most likely associated with deep capillar plexus hypoperfusion, and some reports suggest choroidal hypoperfusion too. So two separate layers of involvement happening. Uh, there was a recent um, report by Dr. Seraf and colleagues looking into the clinical approach to PAM lesions. Uh, they suggested a detailed medical history um, at the time of diagnosis, including vascular risk factors, autoimmune disease, history of trauma, both to uh, the globe in general trauma, uh, medication intake, including caffeine, contraceptives, uh, vasoactive medications, essentially, and also vaccinations. It's most commonly been reported with the flu vaccine, but um, it, there are mentions of the COVID vaccination as well. If the medical history is positive and quote unquote matches our examination findings, there's no need to pursue additional imaging, including fluorescein angiography, and we can just treat the underlying cause if there's a treatment for it. If not, the wide field fluorescein angiography was recommended and specifically looking at to any evidence of a vein occlusion or an artery occlusion, those diagnoses provoking their subsequent management um, as indicated. And if the imaging uh, with the fluorescein angiogram is negative, then it's recommended to pursue more advanced systemic workup. Uh, I also wanted to point out these, we saw those skip lesions on the B scan and there is a report of these fern-like um, changes or hyperreflectivity localized to around the venules in a subset of PAM patients, and it's thought to be in the context of vein occlusions, when with the ischemia being driven pri primarily around the venules and the arterioles being spared, it causes this fern like appearance on the OMFOS image. And on the B scan, it shows up as these quote unquote skip lesions that we appreciate on the photo here, and our patients seem to have as well. So a very recent report by Dr. Seraf and colleagues talked about the coincidence of PAM and AMN lesions, and they looked into a series of patients which had findings suggestive of both. And looking into the driving etiology of these patients, most of these had retinal vein occlusions, and there was a subset that also had Percher's retinopathy and retinal phlebitis. Uh, 
and they propose the common pathogenic pathway from the impairment of the venous outflow channels at the deep capillary plexus, which leads to the possibly Mueller cell disruption and Henle nerve fiber layer uh, disruption on the OCT images. And these are some examples of this report. Uh, as you can see, again, those fern-like distribution of the hyperreflectivity on the um, structural OCT and also on the infrared image that we appreciate as well. And you can see it on the B scan as those skip lesions. So both AMN and PAM lesions there in a setting of vein occlusion. This was a case of vein occlusion with a ciliaretinal artery occlusion. So the PAM lesion here in the superior macula uh, is more diffuse. And there are those skip lesions inferiorly in the context of the vein occlusion. And this is the case of the Percher retinopathy uh, showing both AMN findings and also PAM lesions as well. Um, at this point, how would you manage this patient? Yeah, I mean, we saw kind of mild cystic changes. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't believe that's visually significant. I think most of her visual loss is coming from the photoreceptor loss. Um, you know, I'd probably watch her pretty closely, bring her back. I mean, we saw her two weeks later. Um, I'd probably bring her back um, maybe in a month. Um, and then I'd probably have her follow up with her PCP just for medical optimization because um, we don't really have, you know, a good reason why. Her workup was fairly normal. Um, so medical optimization in this situation, I think, is really important. So given the A1C elevation, we referred her to her primary care provider, and she was started on an additional oral agent. We, in this patient, did initiate anti-VEGF therapy because of the cystoid changes that the patient had started to develop. Um, unclear whether or not it's going to help with her vision, and she's going to follow up with us in a few weeks. But um, does the count fingers vision um, make sense with the findings that we were seeing in this patient? The outer retinal disruption seemed to be pretty focal and subtle. So do you think it's the vein occlusion or the outer retinal changes? It's hard to say, because uh, the foveal area was pretty clear. Most of the disruption was uh, juxtafoveal, I think. Um, but clearly, there's more going on than we think. So um, I'm also, I don't know, I'm, I'm still a little, uh, have a couple of questions about this. but. Um, I, I feel like the AMN lesions here are very uh, different from the isolated AMNR cases that we're used to, uh, just the phenotype. I also found it interesting uh, in that paper that there were um, all the AMN, there was no overlap where there were PAM lesions and AMN lesions, uh, suggesting that either there's blocking so you can't see both from the, the PAM lesion uh, or the mechanism is a little different. Uh, where it's not the capillary plexus, but it's more like chorio capillaris issue. And what is your thought about anti-VEGF therapy for this particular patient? Uh, personally, I think it was a little early. I wouldn't have treated. I probably would have waited a little bit. Uh, I don't think the vision loss was from that little tiny uh, edema. Other attendings agree with that? But very amazing case and great job on like you know making sure you followed up when you felt there was something else going on too okay so i think we're close to time should we stop here or go to the third case stop okay, okay so thank you for your attention and happy thanksgiving everyone <laughs>